Am I on now? Is this thing on? Yes. Okay. So, um, see, nothing, we haven't tried anything yet because, as you heard, I got here yesterday morning. But, I don't know which one to press. Right arrow. Right? There's no arrow. I know how to do the laser. Hmm? Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to press everything. Is it? No. Does he have to turn the numbers back there? I can run it. Oh, okay. Do we need to be closer to that? or? We'll figure that out. So you want to try it back there real quick just to make sure it's working? Oh, there it's coming on. All right, you can just turn it on. Let me see. Yeah, we need to get a chance to try this out before we have Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's such a blessing for us to be here this morning with you. Um, it's been a very long week. Very long week. Um, you can imagine how difficult it was. We lived there for 12 years in Grandview. And it wasn't just a house because we pretty much integrated into the church. So the church is right next to the parsonage. So it's kind of moving like two houses. Um, and unfortunately, during the move, my fingers are all destroyed. So it's hard to type and hold pencils and stuff. Um, because my fingers hurt. And... I had to borrow a Bible from the back because my Bibles are in that truck. <laughs> and all my books and everything else. So um, it was pretty, pretty much, last night was pretty much interesting because I did this all last night. <laughs> um, everything, didn't go, it didn't, everything didn't go like the way I planned, of course, because that's the way things go. Um, we drove out Friday evening, a little after five, and got here a little after six in the morning uh, yesterday. But I know God has a plan, and His plans are always good. Right? Now, speaking of plans, I know there's people wondering, okay, what are you going to do? And truthfully, we don't know each other. Right? You don't know me, and I really don't know you. And I was thinking on the way, on the way down, this is sort of like an arranged marriage. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, we have this commitment to each other. And we're taking this journey together. But we don't know each other. But we don't know each other. That's good. Okay. But we will learn and grow together. And this is my desire for us to learn together and to grow together. I have spoken to a few of you and you know, I've told you that I come from a background of coaches. My grandfather was a coach. My dad was a coach. I started coaching when I was 12 years old. Right? And in my coaching days, my coaching days took a different direction. Um, even though I still miss coaching sports stuff, you know, I coach from Pee Wee's up to high school. I love Pee Wee's, that's fun. You give them the ball and just, <laughs> you don't know what they're going to do. But every time I started a new group with a new group of kids, it always started with fundamentals. Fundamentals, you've got to start from the beginning, the fundamentals. You can't go wrong with fundamentals. And it's always a good place to start. And it t I'll tell you, there's always those kids I already know how to do this. It's okay if you listen, you might learn something that you missed, or you might even get better at it. And actually, these were usually the boys. And I really love coaching girls, because girls always want to learn every little detail. They want to learn everything. The boys are just like, give me the ball and I'll just, yeah. Fundamentals. 
The girls, too, were never afraid of asking questions, unlike the boys, who would always try to fake it. Right? So with all this, let me ask you a question. What does it take to really please God? If we take a look at scriptures, we'll find the answer. Now, what I do, as you, and you found out last time, I'll put up the scriptural references up on top. Right? I'll give you a chance to look it up. Because for me, it's important for you, not just to listen to what I'm telling you, but to look into the scriptures for yourself. And this is what I really enjoy. If you have a hard time finding it, help each other out. And I'll tell you through my experience and from my, me, myself, doing it, once you work with the Bible, you'll get, a, you'll get the hang of it. You'll learn quickly. Eventually, you'll become pros. Now, there's people that like using their phones. I know it's easier. I often use the, the phone myself to search up for scriptures, right? Especially when I'm coaching a teen. You know, one of my teens on Snapchat because I'm 24-7. I'm it's middle of the night. I have a, ke a teen in college. He's asking me questions, biblical questions. And I need to get answers quick. And I use my phone, right? Because I'm not, I'm not an encyclopedia. I don't know where everything's at. So the phone helps me a lot. But... I need to tell you, I really don't like phones in the church. And the reason for this is because we have our Bibles. I, I'm, I'm kind of old school. I like the sound of the ruffling pages. It sounds, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful sound. And when you're, when you're on your phone, especially when I mean, that football is over, but I can be up here and you can be on your phone. You can be watching the game as far as, as, far as I know because I only see the backside of your phone, right? So, um, I was older when I got my first Bible, so I, I cherish God's written word. It's something really special when you have a person that didn't know how to use the Bible and they know how to use it. So it's important. And if you disagree, I ask, ask you, please give me a chance, give me an opportunity, give me a couple of months, use the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, there's Bibles around, like I got one today, <laughs> right? And, and it, honestly, if you, if you don't have a Bible at home, please let me know and I will get you a Bible. I will get you a Bible. Um, I work a lot, a lot with kids in the past. I still do, I, I still do sword drills. Because there's nothing like being able to open the Bible. And I, and I promise you, if you give me this opportunity and put your phones down and pick up a Bible, you will not regret it. So, what does it really take to please God? Let's open up our Bibles to Hebrews 11.6. By the way, I'll be using the Ameri New American Standard Bible. And, you know, and I also want to take this opportunity to talk about where God leads. You know, I, you, you heard my son is in basic training right now. He rolled his ankle and he's going through that. He's already led four kids to Christ. His last letter, which I got last Friday, was that he had three other people going to church with him, plus those four kids, plus his drill instructor. So God prays being used wherever you're at. We always taught our kids, your, your ministry, your mission is where you're at. Doesn't matter where you're at, that's your mission. And, you know, praise God that he's getting used where he's at. My other son... Who's, who's the specialist, he's like, his drill sergeant's going with him? He goes, yeah, he said his drill sergeant. He goes, well, that's weird. <laughs> so, you know, you have an influence around you, and you need to take advantage of that. So if we look at 11, uh, Hebrews 11.6, it says, with, and without faith it's impossible to please him. For the one who comes to God must believe that he exists, and that he proves to be the one 
who rewards those who seek Him. So what does it take to please God? The only way you can please God is by faith. But what does that really mean? All right, we say we're believers. We say we believe in Him. But you know what the problem is? There's so many people that say they believe in Him. And I've known a lot of them, and you probably know them, known them too. So what does that really mean? I want to please Him. I want to have faith that truly pleases Him. Now again, in Scriptures, James gives us, gives us an answer. What kind of faith is God expecting from us? First of all, James tells us there's four things faith does not. And then he tells us what faith is. And this is what we're going to look at this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to be in your word. We ask, Heavenly Father, as we, as we go through it, you would lead us and guide us, open our hearts, our ears, our minds to accept your word, Heavenly Father, and that we can have change in our life. And that change will affect others, not just ours, but those people around us. We ask that as we go through your word, Heavenly Father, that you would guide us and lead us and to bring new avenues to us that we can learn from it. Amen. So what is real faith? Let's take a look at what's not. James 2.14. Don't be afraid to let me hear those pages. It says, what use is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith but no works? Can that faith save him? James is telling us that real faith is not some, just something you say. Take note of the word says. So this person says they have faith. The question is, and? You say you have faith. Good for you. What does that mean? Yeah, we're going to get to that. Right? If you just can't say that you have faith. It can't be something you talk about. You've heard of the saying that talk is cheap. Well, truly, it is. It's cheap. <coughs> you know, Jesus criticized some religious people this time. What does he tell us in Matthew 5, 8? I'm sorry, 15, 8. In Matthew 15, 8. It says, this people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. You know what that says? It says you can say the right, all the right things, and you know what? Not have a love for God. How many times have you heard people say the right words? And you say, whoa, I wonder if they, they believe in God. They probably do believe in God but not the way belief really means. And I'm saying this because I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but to my shame, I've lived it. I've lived that way. I was raised Catholic. So I understand what it says when you say, oh yeah, I believe, I believe in Jesus, I believe in God but not understand what belief really is. So I know this exists, no matter how, many, how much people refute it. Because people say, no, that's not true. It is true, because I know it. James tells us that words don't mean much. If you have the ability to do more. Real faith is not just saying something. What else is real faith not? Let's look at James 2, 15 and 16. If a brother and sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, 
And one of you say to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, yet you do not give them what's necessary for their body? What use is that? All right. Real faith is not just something you feel. You may feel sorry for those who don't know Jesus. You may feel sorry for those who are in need. You may be, feel sorry for those who are in troubles. You know the, the video that Pam showed this morning. There are people in need in country, war-torn countries. You can feel that bad for them, but that one missionary guy, what is he doing? He's doing something about it. He's not saying, oh, wow, that's so sad. He's actually doing something. And let me tell you about some, your, your feelings. You may feel sympathy for those who are poor, who are sick, but what good is that? More than often, what we do in our human experience is that we confuse emotions and feelings with faith. Let me say something a little about feelings and your emotions. I don't know if you ever noticed your feelings and your emotions are not something you should have confidence in. Why? Because one day I feel good, today I feel pretty bad. My fingers hurt, my back hurts, everything hurts, my leg hurts, I have a headache. Tomorrow I'll, I'll feel good. How about your emotions? Your emotions are up down, up and down, this and that, this and that. Can you have confidence in that? You can't. Do I know I'm going to feel good tomorrow? No, I hope I do. <laughs> we can't have confidence in those, our emotions and our feelings. But how many times do we see something and we want it? Right? Or we do something because, you know, we, we, we feel something or we have an emotion, emotion, emotional reaction to something. Buying something on television. Wow, oh, you really need this. You need this thing jig -a jig And you're like, whoa, look at that, honey. Look at this. We need that. And you buy it. <laughs> Only to get it later. Right? We all do these things. We can't go by our emotions or with our feelings without using our processor right without using your brain because what how's it how good does it turn out if we if we do stuff with our emotions and our feelings it doesn't turn out very well so james says you feel bad for them but do nothing about it what good is it think about it what good is it Real faith is not something you feel. What else is there? What is not real faith? In James 2, 6, 2, 18. It says, but someone, said, may, sorry, but someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without that, the works and I will show you my faith by my works. Now, real faith is not something you think. Some people think of faith and treat it like a philosophy. I choose to believe this, you choose to believe that. It's like something up in the mind, uh, you believe a certain fact or knowledge. So what does that all mean? It means that you can have it and not do nothing with it. You can believe in God, yet live any way you like. Does that work? No. You can believe the Bible and not do what God says. Does that work? No. But this is what people do. You might think, no, not really. But you know what? Maybe it's you that thinks this way. Understand that real faith is not something you think about. Okay, let's look at another in James 2.19. You believe God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. That's right, real faith is not something you, you just believe. A lot of people have strong beliefs about Jesus Christ, strong beliefs about God, strong beliefs about the Bible. 
We sometimes hear people say, I believe this, I believe that. You believe there's one God? Good. Even the demons believed in God. As a matter of fact, you know what? They know God. They know God. They know He exists. And they shudder at the thought. You know the difference between believing that people talk about? Why well, believe in God? See, these demons believe. And you can say you believe. These demons do not have a relationship with God. You can have a relationship with God. When we talk about belief, it's about relationship. Relationship. We need to understand that the Christian faith is not about saying, feeling, thinking, or believing. Or believing. All these separate nor together are enough. And you know why? Because Jesus didn't come to give us a set of doctrines, a set of beliefs. Jesus came to give us a new life. So what do you think? Let me tell you. He came to give us a new life that we're expected to live. Are you living that life that he came to give us? Now look at what we're told in James 2.20. But you are willing to acknowledge, you foolish person, that faith without works is useless. I think Chris said that, right? Faith is something you do, your actions, things you do. The word James uses as deeds, actions, and what I do. Let's look again at James 8, uh, 2.18 and see what else do we see there. Right? It said, someone, but someone may say, well, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith with my works. See, our faith can be seen and it can and will be displayed to the world to see. And let me explain. Because there are religions which go off track to what James is actually saying. And when I'm, um, when I'm up here, allow me to share that being a true follower of Jesus, Christ is not about religion, it's about relationship. Amen. Satan loves religion because it takes focus off of that relationship. We will, we're eventually going to build on this, but I want you to keep that thought in your mind. Satan loves religion because it takes our focus off of the relationship. Remember, we're on this journey together. It starts today. We're on this journey together, and we're going to get there together. So this works thing. Works-based religions believe that this verse tells them that they need to do works to have faith. Now, my car. If you don't put gas into it, if I don't put any gas in it, into it and get into there, turn my key, what's going to happen? Nothing. Nothing's going to happen to my car. Right? I expect it to turn on, it's, nothing's going to happen. But if I put gra gas into it, turn that key, it's going to crank up. It's doing something. And at the end of the process, there's a little pipe in the end of the back of my car where exhaust comes out. That exhaust comes out because of all the things that are happening in the entire process. The gas, the, the little, I mean, I don't know how the engine works. You know, there's an explosion that turns the pistons, right? And the exhaust comes from all that stuff going on in there. I know how to change oil. But <laughs> I don't know much, nothing much. That exhaust comes out because something happens. That's work that's working. 
That, that exhaust is the works that's coming out, showing the proof that something's happening in the engine. God put something in you. And your, that works that you're doing is exhaust. Right? The exhaust that shows that something's happening in you. You're like an engine. You can, end, you can add water, you can o add oil, but without the gas, it's not going to work. It doesn't serve a purpose. If you don't put gas in the car, what is, you can't even say it's a paperweight because it's too big. What good is the car if you can't put gas into it? Well, today you have electric cars, right? If it doesn't have the fuel, it is not going to work. And what is the gas? What is the gas in your life, in your new life? It's God. What God does in you, that action that happens in you, that exhausts your works. That's, that's a result of what God's doing in you. Do you understand what that verse says? Right? Without works, you have no faith. You know why? Because the works shows that, that your engine's working. You have that gas. You have God in you. And that's working in your life. That's the life that God wants you to have. That new life. And that we need to be living that. It's the, the world is going to see your faith. You're not showing off. It's not about being fake either. It's about being genuine. It's something like you can't control. I'm trying to think today. Today they read it up here about the glass of overflowing. When you put water in a glass, can you keep it from overflowing? If you put too much water in, you can't keep it from overflowing. It's going to overflow. The works it happens in your life because you can't help it. It's going to come naturally. You can't fake it. You can't go through the motions. If you have the Holy Spirit working in you, that's going to happen. You can't stop it. How could you? D.L. Moody once said, we have the love of God in our hearts. We don't have to go up and down the earth to proclaim it. Don't need to tell people. It will show in everything we do. You know, we have the experience a lot of times where we're just at random places and people just come up to and, are you guys believers? Are you guys Christians? And one time while I was in my sister's pool at a house in Los Angeles, and this guy came up to me and he goes, can I ask you a question? I go, oh yeah, what's up? I never met him before. He's my sister's boyfriend's friend or cousin or something. And can I ask you a question? I go, yeah, yeah, sure. He goes, are you guys Christians? I go, matter of fact, we are. You know, people just see it in you. You, you don't have to dis, you know, put a sign on your neck and say, I'm a Christian. People can see it in you. They know who you are. Right? It's automatic. In Hebrews 11, it tells us about men and women of God in the past who were able to accomplish God's purpose because they acted in faith. Now, I believe God hears me. Then, I must spend time praying. If I believe God cares, then I must visit people who are hurting in need of help. If I believe Jesus is our only Savior, then I must find ways to bring my friends to church. Our next verse, our Awana kids, all, both of them, oh, I don't think they go to Awana. Well, if you're familiar with Awana, you should know the next verse, right? Ephesians 2, 8-10. I wasn't a want a commander, so uh, I worked my ways up from listening. My in our ascending church, my old pastor he says, Tony, I want you to come and be a listener at Awana. I was like, Awana? I was like, What's that? He goes, You'll you'll love it. Just come and and you know come and listen to the kids. And he wanted me to get involved because the kids were kind of drawn to me for some reason. Um, 
So I went to Awana and I listened and I, I really liked it, enjoyed it. I became a listener and I became a leader and then I became a director and then eventually I became a direct uh, commander. And I was certified twice. So I like working with the kids. I think Awana is a great program. It's for by grace you have been saved through faith. And it's not of ourselves, it's a gift from God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so we could walk in them. See, the Bible says that you have a ministry if you're saved. You have something you need to do. You are to serve God by serving others. God prepared in advance for you to do. I shared with you about my son. I don't think he had any idea he was going to go to basic and he was going to save kids. He, I didn't think he, was, he had any idea before he went to basic, he was going to write to me and say, Hey, Dad, can you send me some wellness books so I can share with some of the guys? But you know what? God prepared him for that. Because there isn't other people sharing. There's he, him. He is sharing. And God prepared him for that. God has prepared you. And if you're not prepared, guess what? We're going to grow together. We're going to learn together. We're all going to get prepared. We're all going to learn how to share the gospel. There's not one way. There's lots of ways. But there's only one word to share. We're going to learn these things together. And we're going to grow, not only within, but with others. God created us to be disciples. Right? He didn't create us to be, in, in Matthew doesn't say, you know, go out and create believers. Go out and create disciples. How do you create a disciple? You need to share. A believer just sits there. We're not called to sit there. We're called to go out and proclaim his word. And we're going to share his word. And like I said, well, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. Well, I'm too shy. You will learn. We will learn together. And we will grow together.